Hello, my name is Andre. I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, welcoming, me, welcoming me to your uh, beautiful city in Utrecht. I've been here many times before and it's as lovely as ever. Today, uh, I'd like to share a story with you. Basically, this is a story about becoming digital and kind of having a moment of clarity. One minute, I find that you're looking around at the world and you see things a certain way. And then something kind of hits you, a kind of a realization of sorts. A few ideas tend to kind of coalesce inside your head, and they you know, become a stream of cohesive thoughts. You look around and suddenly things seem to make sense, both intellectually and kind of viscerally. In that moment, it's kind of like magic, I think. Um, it's one of those things where one second you understand things one way, and then the next second you understand them in a completely different way. Now, when those moments happen, I tend to think we need to uh, latch onto them. I tend to think we need to uh, find ways to fully understand them. And uh, to make the most out of them, I think we need to share them. And so that's what I do with you today. Now, I grew up uh, in the 80s in high school, so I went to high school in the 80s, and during that time, I worked uh, on the high school yearbook. I was in the club where we actually made the yearbook for the school. It was kind of a very tedious and precise process, but it was a process that I think taught me a lot about design, especially since we were able to work with, with professional equipment. Back then, we had a team of student editors and photographers and uh, copywriters. And we had all the same kinds of tools that anybody had at the time who made magazines. We had uh, the old-fashioned typewriters. You would type your copy on those things, and you would type it on the sheets of lines numbered paper. We had, uh, had to measure out and spec all of that copy to make sure it fit the page. And we had nice cameras, took lots of pictures. And we were even able to develop and choose and edit our pictures for our, for our yearbook. We also had a traditional dark room, the kind that had the red safe lights and the bins of chemicals and the photo enlargers. Uh, I remember helping out students uh, unpack the rolls of film and then making them into digital, uh, excuse me, into film negatives, and then taking those film negatives and shooting it onto photo paper with the, the photo enlargers. I remember I had to learn how to handle a camera in the dark, how to load and unload the film without being able to see anything. You had to just use your hands. I remember using uh, the old-fashioned cropping tools and kind of marking up the photos. And you had to kind of imagine what the photos would look like on the page when it was printed. There was no way to see it. The thing I remember most distinctly, though, was that darkroom. It had this very distinct smell. It was kind of like that chemical pungent sweetness. It's almost kind of sickly a little bit. As a process, the entire thing was very tactile. It was very physical. I could kind of see and feel and smell each step of the process as we were making our yearbook. So when I got my start as a designer, it was in the 90s, and all of those traditional design processes, processes that I just explained were in transition. Everything was going digital. Desktop publishing had become mainstream. Uh, it was become the norm and the standard. You had things like postscript embedded printers. You had uh, color Macintoshes and color displays and film recorders, and Photoshop had just hit the market. Now, I've uh, always had a passion for computers. When I was growing up, my father bought me a Timex Sinclair 1000, a little tiny machine that had 1K of RAM, but I learned how to program BASIC on it. Back in high school, I actually used uh, all this PageMaker 1.0 at the time to kind of make the theater programs for the, for the high school plays. And in between high school and college, I uh, worked as a theater production hand in Chicago, which you didn't make a lot of money. So to make some money and during the day, I had a temp job. And because I knew how to use a computer, I was helping a lot of graphic artists make uh, advertisements and brochures and slides with their new computers at the time. Then, during the 90s, I got my dream job. I was able to then lead the design of Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign at Adobe. And there I got to work on what would then become the Adobe Creative Suite. So basically I'm telling you this because I spent an entire decade in the 90s basically deeply immersed in all things that was design and tech related. As such, I'd like to believe that I have a pretty deep knowledge of all things that have to do with pixels. But 
I'll have to be kind of honest here. I think when I look back on it, my understanding was more academic. I didn't have a true understanding of what a pixel was or what being digital meant. I had been working at my job for at least 10 years before I finally had an insight. It was March 2003, and I was back at Adobe Systems. I was working on a research project uh, around digital photography. The project was called, uh, codenamed Shadowland, and it's the, product that, uh, the project that actually wound up becoming uh, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. Now, pro the professional photography industry was going through massive change at that time, in the same way that the desktop publishing industry was changing printing and publishing 10 years before. Canon and Nikon and all the manufacturers were spending enormous amounts of money and resources developing uh, new digital cameras, new sensors for those cameras, and new software for those cameras. At Adobe, we were just trying to figure out where it was all going. Things were moving extremely fast. Everything was changing at an extraordinary pace. I remember listening to photographers in the business struggle and try to figure out what it meant that their world was changing around them. What was going on? What did it mean to have a photograph become digital? So one day, I took one of the new cameras that I had in my office at Adobe at our headquarters in San Jose. I just took it, I went outside, and I decided to take some snapshots of just stuff around the building, just interesting things, just walking around, taking pictures. When I had what I wanted, I went back up to my office, and I opened the camera, I took out the flash card, stuck that flash card into the computer on my desk, it was a Macintosh, um, and I just downloaded the images onto it. Now at the time, I had a uh, early, early copy or set of code of uh, Shadowland, and I opened up some of the photos with it. You know, I did some simple things, simple corrections, you know, a little bit of contrast, a little bit of cropping, some editing, etc. And uh, then I also, luckily enough, because it was at Adobe and we had lots of money and that was great, I had a Epson photo printer on my desk. So I've got all these cameras, I got uh, these Macintosh computers, and I got Epson photo printer. So I took some of the photos that I've been messing with and I printed it onto the, uh, the photo printer. Now, at the end of that, I held a picture in my hand a photo, and I, for some reason, just kind of asked myself, where did that come from? And that's when it kind of hit me. You see, in that moment, I suddenly remembered all the things that I did back in high school, the traditional process for, for uh, making a photo. I remembered that smell, that very distinct chemical smell. I remembered developing the negatives. I remember taking those negatives and shooting them onto photo paper. In that process, I was able to watch a film negative develop into a photo. Now, in traditional film, with film, basically, light hits the film and there's a chemical reaction. Now, for me, there's something about that chemical reaction that just feels real. There's something there. But this new digital process, this digital photo I had printed, I had in my hand, what had happened with it? Well, I took a picture with the camera, I pressed the button, the shutter opened, light flooded through the lens, all that part, that part was exactly the same, that felt normal. But instead of a chemical reaction happening on film, the light hit the CMOS sensor in the camera, and the sensor converted it. The sensor converted that light into RGB values, into numbers, into math. I had in my hand a photo that came into existence from pure math. It was digital. It was based off of data. It came from numbers, and I manipulated it mathematically. So after all those years of working in the industry, you know, a decade or so, for some reason it just suddenly all made sense. Now, I often like to tease designers getting into um, the software design business. I'll ask them a, a, a question. It's a simple question. The question is, how big is a pixel? It's a simple question. How big is a pixel? No one? It's obviously a trick question. You see, the answer is, a pixel is as only as big as a pixel. Right? A pixel has no physical properties. Now, in software terms, 
a pixel is only expressed as math. It doesn't have any properties until you present it on a device like a computer display or a mobile screen or a photo printer or this monitor you have behind me, this, this movie screen. At its core, though, make no mistake, a pixel only exists as math. It has different components. Oftentimes, it has a red, green, and blue value. Sometimes, it has a CMYK value. It can have different bit depths, you know, larger numbers, so you can do more subtle and complex computations with it. And sometimes, it can have an extra property, like an opacity or transparency value. But in the end, a pixel is just math. Now, on its own, a pixel is not much to look at. It's actually rather boring. But that's not the beauty of a pixel. The beauty of a pixel is when you put it with other pixels. That's when it gets interesting. The more pixels you provide, the more interesting it gets. And when you present millions of pixels together, well, You get a photograph. Once a photograph becomes data, once a photograph becomes math, it can then be manipulated in all sorts of new, new ways with software. You can change its contrast by recalculating the pixel values. You can adjust its exposure. Most importantly, with digital photographs, you can actually extract details in the shadows that you couldn't see before, even when that photo was taken in low lighting conditions. And that's it. That was my moment of clarity. That was my insight. Once something becomes digital, you can analyze, process, rearrange, normalize, distort, clarify, or just simply store it for future use. Once something becomes digital, you can do amazing things with it for good, and yes, for ill. So here's the thing. Look around today, and what do you see? What I see is a world that's going digital. We are all now sending out tweets about what's going on around us. And those tweets have meaningful strings of text in them. There's metadata about those tweets, about time and location. There's sometimes a photo or a video attached to a tweet. Well, now sending status and check-in messages to social networks, leaving digital breadcrumbs of our lives behind. We're taking geotagged photos with our mobile phones and chronicling history as it unfolds. Some of us are uh, wearing devices to track our personal health metrics and get data out of that to do something with it, like I need to. Right now, we're storing all sorts of digital information whether it be our photos, our music, our memories, all into the cloud. So one of the things that excites, excites me the most with where all this is going is all the new means and methods and ways we're going to be able to use that data and find meaning out of it. When an event occurs today, people post photos about it. They'll post links to stories with breaking information. They'll add uh, their own comments, and sometimes they'll just chat about it. More importantly, what they're doing is they're converting that event into data. Think about it. People are now transcribing the world events around us in real time into a digital format. They're making it and turning it into math. In effect, we're all now doing what the digital camera was doing. We're now converting our world into data. And once our world is in digital format, like a photograph, we'll be able to analyze, process, range, normalize, distort, clarify, or just simply store it for future use. And let's be very clear, we're going to have massive amounts of data to sift through. But the good news is that we're going to find all sorts of new stories in that data. And most importantly, we're going to be able to extract 
all the hidden details in the shadows that we couldn't see before because it wasn't in digital format. Once our world becomes data, once it becomes math, it too can be manipulated with software in a multitude of fascinating and brand new ways that we can only imagine at this point in time. And yes, we'll be able to do so for good and for ill. Thank you. <laughs>